Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mario Guajardo. I'm originally from uh, Mexico, and I work in platforms here as a software engineer. Uh, this is part of my 20%. And today, we have a great speaker. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, a couple of Googlers got together about a year ago, and we said, why can't we do different at Google to spread role models? And it was very, very easy. We say, why don't we invite them to speak at Google, and we put them on YouTube. Uh, and we created a, a channel, and we have tons of visitors. Uh, but today, we are really, really honored just not to have a role model, but one of the greatest role models uh, in the Hispanic community. Uh, and today, uh, we hope you enjoy this talk. You can still go go slash uh, NASA talk questions to ask questions on Dory. We have about 25 offices, most of uh, North America, uh, Mexico City, uh, Sao Paulo, Belo Horizonte, and, and, and uh, Buenos Aires that are also uh, listening to this talk remotely. Uh, so feel free to ask questions. We also have a couple of uh, live questions at the end. Uh, the time is very short at the end, so uh, feel free to, to go to Dory if you can. And today we have an, an honor uh, to introduce him, but uh, in order to do so, uh, I'm going to hand off the mic to two great Googlers. Uh, one of them is Tiffany uh, Montagui. She runs all of her space-related programs. She's going to talk a little bit about that. And then Gonzalo Vegaso is one of the founders of SGN. Uh, he's going to introduce the speaker today. So I hope you really enjoy this talk. Thank you, Mario. Uh, my name is Tiffany Montague. I manage our space initiative. Some of you might know me by my MoMA title, which is the commander of the universe. Uh, I, I use my incredible space powers today to summon actually not one, but two astronauts. We have two astronauts here, Yvonne Cagle. Uh, uh, I, I've always known that I wanted to be involved in the space business. Uh, in fact, prior to Google, I was in the space field. I was flying in a high altitude airplane uh, as a flight test engineer at Johnson Space Center. Um, I even applied for astronaut training uh, twice, and I didn't make it. And I was heartbroken for about a day until I realized that there were two ways into the space community. Uh, one, NASA, uh, the government, and two, commercial space, and that's partly why Google is involved uh, in space initiatives. Um, I've spent the past several years cultivating some space projects that you are probably familiar with. One, our relationship with NASA. Two, the Google Lunar X Prize. Uh, in the past 12 months alone, we have launched some amazing products with NASA, uh, Google Moon, Google Mars, uh, and the Google Lunar X Prize is well on its way to success. I think it'll be one before 2015. And we have 22 teams, 22 global teams from around the world who are competing in a race to the moon. So why is Google involved in these space projects? Well, we are all technologists, all scientists, all engineers. And most of us are space enthusiasts, right? Yeah. Uh, we are also really strong supporters of openness. Open source, open internet. Why not open access to space, right? Uh, in the case of Google Lunar X Prize, it's the largest incentive prize ever offered. And the goal is not just technical achievement and the demonstration of lunar capability. It's uh, investing in a future technological workforce and it's demonstrating a new space economy. And in my short conversation with Jose earlier today, I learned that he shares those goals. But to do that, we need to first remove this mental logjam that exists, right, about the access to space, about whether it's possible to go to space and not be a government. Um, we need to fundamentally change the public's perceptions about space exploration so that they know space should be open and accessible to everyone. And I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, I was promised that in the future we would have robots and jetpacks, and we'd all be vacationing on the moon. Well, it's 2010, and I'm ready. <laughs> so I hope all this happens in our lifetimes, in my lifetime specifically. Otherwise, we're going to need a prize for cryogenics. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'll hand it off to my colleague, Gonzalo. 
Thank you very much, Tiffany. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gonzalo Vegaso. I'm a director of accounting. And uh, on behalf of uh, Google and uh, the Spani Google Network, I'm extremely happy to introduce you Mr. Jose Hernandez. Jose is an engineer and NASA, a NASA astronaut. He was born in California on Mexican descent, and as a child, he worked alongside his family and other farm workers in the fields of California. Moving from one town to another, harvesting crops, he did not learn to speak English until he was 12 years old. It was until he was 41 that NASA finally accepted him into the astronaut training program and later assigned him to the crew of the space shuttle mission STS-128. Jose also served as a chief of the materials and processes branch of Johnson Space Center and received recognition for his work at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he co-developed the first fulfilled digital mammography imaging system, proven to detect breast cancer at an earlier stage than previous techniques. He also worked in the international arena where he represented Lawrence Livermore and the U.S. Department of Energy in Ru on Russian nuclear non-proliferation non issues. He earned a B.S. in electrical engineering from the University of the Pacific, an M.S. in electrical and computer engineering from the University of California at Santa Barbara, in, in, uh, uh, where he was also awarded an honorary doctor of law degree in 2006. Jose created the Jose Hernandez Reaching for the Stars Foundation in December 2005, a nonprofit organization. Having been raised by parents in a, in, in a migrant, yet grounded family, Jose believes that all children, despite family challenges, should have the same educational opportunities he did. Inspired by Dr. Franklin Chan Diaz, who in the, eight, in the 1980s became the first Hispanic American astronaut, Jose now wants children to also become inspired to learn more about math and science. With that, please let me introduce you, Mr. Jose Hernandez. Thank you. Thank you, Gonzalo, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, Stephanie, I think uh, Lockheed Martin just announced that they have their commercial jetpacks. Uh, they're a little expensive right now, but I think, I, think, I think they're developing it pretty good. And, and Mario, thank you very much, and to the whole Hispanic Googlers Network for extending this invitation. Also to my colleague, uh, Yvonne Cagle from NASA Ames. She's the one that actually put us in contact, and uh, she sent me the original email. And of course, when they said Google, I said, hey, I'm, I'm interested in seeing what you guys are doing over here. And let me tell you, I spent the whole morning here, and, uh, and I want to come work with you guys. I mean, this is, <laughs> it's, a, it's a neat place. You know, you think NASA is neat. You guys, you guys have it all, man. It, it, it is neat. Uh, I think uh, my colleague Ed Liu already beat me to it, though. I think you guys already have your, your quota of one astronaut, so whenever he moves on, just make sure you guys give me a call, all right? But uh, this is going to be a little bit like church, okay? Uh, you know, I, I, have, I, have, I have a treat for you guys at the very end, you know, and you, but first you got to listen to the sermon, okay? <laughs> uh, the, treat, the treat at the very end is going to be, a, I have about an 18-minute video that summarizes my mission from last year. It was aboard, um, on board STS-128 Discovery, and it was from August 28th of last year through September 11th. And uh, we went all the way up to the International Space Station, uh, connected with them, and uh, we formed a, a group of uh, seven of us from, from my crew and six from the station, and 13 of us were up in space simultaneously, and, uh, which was something very incredible. But, but before I do that, I, I think I need to tell you a little bit about myself so that, um, so that you guys can better appreciate um, what, what, what you guys are to the community, like it or not. I think uh, you guys are, uh, are role models to our community. And, uh, and I'm sure the 80-20 uh, that you guys have the ability here, a lot of you choose to use that 20 uh, to go out in the community and do some good in terms of influencing our kids to get into science, technology, engineering, and math, get into the STEM fields. And I think that is, that is very important. I think uh, the, the, the um, you know, I was listening to, to the White House when they were, they had this event for community colleges. And uh, I think it was uh, Jill Biden said some quote that really stuck to me. And, and, and that is the, uh, the, the countries that out-educate us today 
are going to outcompete us tomorrow. And it's very important that we engage our kids into the STEM fields if we're going to remain competitive on a global basis. And so, so that's sort of the soapbox that I'm going to get into that you guys are going to have to put up with for the next 15, 20 minutes. And then, uh, and then I'll give you guys the treat, all right? Um, as was mentioned, I come from a typical migrant farm working family. I'm first generation. I was born here in the States. And, uh, and so you would say, well, you know, what's a typical migrant farm working family? And let me, let me paint the scenery for you. Uh, it's actually uh, quite simple. My parents came from uh, Michoacan, the state of Michoacan in Mexico. If you, uh, if you balance Mexico on a pin, uh, that center of mass there, that's where Michoacan's at. So we're dead center in Mexico. And uh, every year, my dad would, um, would load up the kids in the car. It was four of us, and I was the youngest one. We'd load up the, the kids in the car, mom as well, and we would make a two-day trip uh, through Mexico, northern Mexico, all the way up to Southern California. We would reach Ontario near Los Angeles, and we would spend about a month and a half there picking strawberries. Uh, that's how we would start the season. Then about a month and a half later, we would drive up to Salinas, and then we would pick uh, lechuga, which is the lettuce. We would work in the hoe, hoeing with respect to uh, thinning out sugar beets and whatever it was they were planting. And then after that, we would then, uh, two months later, move up to the Stockton area, Stockton, Tracy, Modesto, and we would hang out here the bulk of our time, uh, start working and picking uh, cucumbers, uh, tomatoes, uh, cherries, anything that was in season, we picked it. And then after that, November would roll around, and now we would make what would be the two and a half day trip back to Mexico. And we would cool our heels between November and February in Mexico, and then that process would begin again. Uh, and we would do that year after year. So you can see that that is why it took me until I was 12 years old to dominate the English language. I mean, I was being pulled out from different school districts throughout the year, and, uh, and so there was very little stability. And, uh, and, 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 and so I remember, uh, I remember that, um, that one thing that my parents did different than what a typical migrant farm working family was, in spite of their third grade education, was that they put a lot of emphasis in education. They didn't understand it, but they knew it was something good. And so Monday through Friday, Wherever we were, we were in school. And Saturday, Sunday rolled around. Wherever we were, we were working right aside mom and dad in the fields, trying to uh, you know, supplement the family income. And, um, and, and while a lot of kids look forward to uh, summer vacation, you know, the Hernandez kids kind of hated summer vacation because we knew what that signified. <laughs> that represented we had to be out there in the field seven days a week, so that was no fun. Uh, I, I also remember. I also remember that uh, you know, my parents were very, very smart. You know, I swear they would have made great psychologists because uh, one of the things that they always did is they did little things that kind of had a lot of strong, a strong message with respect to education. I remember uh, every day when we used to, uh, it, it almost turned out to be a game, but, but uh, whenever we used to uh, go home after a long day's work, for example, if we were picking cucumbers, you, know, you wear Levi's, and they get muddy in the morning, and then they dry up during the day. The sun bakes them. I remember when we used to go home, us kids used to play games, see who could make their Levi's stand up on themselves. You know, cause that's, you know, and we used to kid around that you know, that's the person that worked the hardest that day. But actually, it's, it, I always won because I was always rolling around in the mud because I was the youngest one, right? So, but anyway, I remember every day my dad used to, you know, we used to get in the back seat of the car after a long day's work. We were hot, sweaty, dusty. And before he start the car, and like I said, we used to, we used to make this a game because we said, he's going to forget today. He's going to forget. And before he put the key in the ignition, he would look back and say, how do you guys feel today? And that was the message all, every day. And of course, we would always say, well, we're tired. And he said, well, good. He says, remember this feeling. He says, because if you don't go to school, he said, I'm not going to force you to go to school. But if you don't go to school, get good grades, this is what you're going to do the rest of your life. And so it was a pretty, uh, uh, pretty powerful message. Also, I remember each time we came home from school, each time we came home from school, um, my mom would always sit us on the kitchen table you know, while she made her homemade tortillas and, and food for us to eat after school, 
she, uh, she made sure that we finished our homework. And she helped us with our homework up to the third grade. After the third grade, you know, since that's all she went to school for, I mean, she couldn't help us anymore. But uh, it only took me once, though. I figured out she was smart enough not to, uh, not to help us, but she was smart enough to realize that we, if we, to know if we finished our homework or not, because it only took me one test uh, <laughs> to test her out on that and a visit with the belt to, uh, to not, not try it again. So I made sure I, I did finish my homework every day. Uh, but, 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 you know, things, uh, uh, that's how it was when I was in, uh, was small as, as I remember it. Uh, and things ch actually changed a bit when I was, um, when I was in about in the second grade. I mentioned I'm the, I was the youngest in the family, and um, I was in second grade, November rolled around, and it was time to go to Mexico, right? And we, here we were in Stockton, and, and my teacher, tell, you know, my dad tells me, hey, we're getting ready to go to Mexico, like he always did every year, get three months worth of homework, because when we went to Mexico, we self-studied ourselves. We did our own homework uh, since Christmas vacation was around the corner and it wasn't worth it for us to go to school in Mexico. So we took three months worth of homework. And so I said, okay, that's fine. So I went to school that day and I talked to my teacher, Mrs. Young, a, a young Chinese teacher. She was real tall. Well, I mean, tall for a second grader because she's actually short, but, but you know, second grader, <laughs> she, looked, she looked tall to me. And anyway, uh, a beautiful young uh, uh, Chinese teacher, and, uh, and I told Mrs. Young, I said, Mrs. Young, we're going to Mexico. Can I have my three months worth of homework? And, and, and she looked at me, and her eyes, you know, she rolled her eyes. And of course, she had been through this routine with my three other siblings, because they'd been through the second grade. So she knew the routine. But this time, she said, you know what? Tell your dad and mom that I'm coming home today to visit them. And I said, oh, OK. So that day, I ran home. We lived about a mile and a half from school. You know, you cross railroad tracks, packing sheds, and all that. And in those days, you could walk to school for a mile and a half. I guess these days, you'll get arrested for child abuse if you let your kid, <laughs> your kid walk a mile and a half to school, right? But in those days, it was all right. I remember I ran that day as fast as I could. And I told my, my parents, you know, I said, hey, this teacher's going to come today. And of course, you get two separate reactions from your parents, right? <laughs> the first reaction is your dad. You know, the first thing he starts doing, he starts taking off his belt, <laughs> says, all right, boy, what do you do? And I, keep, and I tell him, I didn't do anything, I promise. He said, you know it's going to be twice as bad if she tells me what you do if you don't tell me, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I, I promise, I think it has to do with Mexico. And he said, OK, you better be right, boy. He said, you better be right. I said, yeah. And of course, the other reaction is completely opposite from the mom, right? Mom, it's, and if you're Hispanic, you would understand this more, I think. But you get that home alone reaction from mom, you know? The teacher's coming, we gotta clean the house. <laughs> we gotta cook a feast, because la maestra's coming. You know, it's, you know, Hispanics have this uh, big respect for educators, and so, and so, uh, so, you know, all the bells and whistles come out when they figure that the maestro was coming. And as I remember, she came, we ate very good. I, even, I remember even, even telling my teacher, Mrs. Young, I said, you ought to come more often. Because <laughs> yeah, we ate so well that day. And, uh, and, and, and so, and so, and so um, she came and, you know, after, after dinner and everything, you know, in her words, uh, and, and I remember she used terms that my parents could understand because uh, I sort of helped interpret uh, and, and she basically told my parents, she said, hey, you know, you guys ought to stay in one place. You know, don't live a nomadic life. You know, set root in one place so the trees can grow strong. And obviously the trees were the kids, the four kids, because she had had all four kids. And she said, look, your kids, I've had all four of them. They're, they're kind of bright. And if you give them a chance, you know, they can be something uh, when they grow up. And my parents, you know, to, again, to, uh, to their credit, uh, they, they, they actually took that advice. I mean, we still went to Mexico that year, but we, instead of coming back to Ontario and doing the, uh, the migrant thing, we went straight to Stockton. And we started making Stockton our home. And then our three-month trip started shrinking to about three weeks, centered around Christmas holidays, so we didn't miss a lot of school. And that's when our education started to get traction. And it was, it was also the fact that, you know, my parents, my mom, like I said, she was made great psychologist. I mean, she also put the burden on us with respect to getting an education. Because she, she would never say, oh, you know, I hope you guys go to college. I hope you guys are going to do this. She always said, when. You know, she sort of set that bit on, in, in our brain. And she always said, you know, it was expected. We didn't know any better. You know, even though they only went to the third grade, 
we knew that we had to go to college, else our, we're gonna, we were going to have to answer with our parents, to our parents. So, uh, so, so that's when we started getting traction in our education, because we started getting a little bit more stability. And I, I guess the other thing, the question would, would say is, well, then how was it that you actually became an astronaut, or what, what made you become an astronaut? And I think I could point to three events in my life that sort of took me to that, to that, uh, to that point or to this road that I'm now uh, walking on. The first, I think I have to uh, give thanks to my migrant farm working background because uh, I remember as a kid when we used to go work in the fields, we used to go in the darkness of night right before dawn, before the sun comes up. You know, you drive out to the fields. So you go out in the country away from light pollution, and my favorite part of the, of the trip was, you know, when we got there, I was able to get out. It was dark, and I could look up, and, you know, no light pollution from city lights or anything, and you could see the dark sky. And you could see the stars, and, you know, they were they, almost like in 3D, they were so clear. And, and so I just had that attraction to it. Probably didn't hurt the fact that Star Trek was on during that time. <laughs> but, uh, but, 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 but really, that's what attracted me. And then... Um, and then the next one was when I was about 10 years old. Unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember the, uh, the tail end of the Apollo program. And I remember Apollo 17 very clear. Uh, we, we, uh, as you guys know, or uh, well, yeah, you guys are so young, you guys wouldn't know. But, uh, but, but uh, if you guys may have read in the history books, how's that? <laughs> um, you know, when there was an Apollo mission and there was a moonwalk, uh, they would preempt programming on TV, and you would have folks like Walter Cronkite, you know, narrate the moonwalk. And of course, uh, the very last mission, Apollo 17, uh, everybody, you know, everybody would stop and watch the mission, and and everybody in the U.S. and the world, I imagine, and the Hernandez family was no different. Only difference is the fact that uh, we had an old black and white TV, and I'm not sure if you guys have seen pictures of those old black and white TVs. But there are those big consoles, like a piece of furniture. You know, they have a screen in the middle and integrated speakers, four little legs, and a big honky knob to change the channel. Uh, that was our TV. Uh, the only difference with ours was that ours was black and white, and uh, and snowy picture. And I remember sometimes you lose that horizontal sink. You get that bar in the picture, and so the only way to fix it is you know you hit it on the side, and then it would stop. You know, that was our TV. And uh, you know, at that time, there wasn't any uh, satellite TV programming, and, uh, but we did have cable TV. But God forbid we had cable because we couldn't afford it. So we had the next best thing. We had what was called rabbit ear antennas to increase reception on top of the TV. And so, of course, uh, whenever something important came on, you know, the family wanted a nice, clear picture, right? So guess who they called to adjust the TV? You know, I was, uh, since I was the youngest one, right, I was the official channel changer. And I know, I know now why this happens, but, you know, because I'm an electrical engineer. But as soon as I grabbed the antenna, guess what happened? You know, the, the picture would improve, right? And guess what my dad would say? Stay there. <laughs> you know? so, so here I am in a contortionist mode trying to watch, watch TV while trying to keep mom and dad and the, uh, my rest of my siblings happy and them watching a good, uh, a good picture, right? And, uh, and I also remember, also remember, you know, whenever we needed to change the channel, you know, guess who the official channel changer was? It was yours truly as well. And I remember one day when, um, when, 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 I, when I went up for the umpteenth time to change the channel, my, uh, you know, I figured I'd say, okay, I'm gonna say something very subtle to my dad, because, you know, my, you, you had to understand my dad, you can't, you can't direct him to do anything or, you know, you'll get yourself slapped. Uh, but, but I would say I'm going to do something very political and just kind of say it very subtle as, as he sent me for the 12th time to change the channel that day. Uh, I'd say, hey, Dad, you know, you know they have those new TVs now that have remote control and they're color too. And, 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 then so, and I went quickly. I said, I'm going to go quickly and change the channel so he doesn't get mad at me. So I changed it. And then I went back and sat down and then he stood up and he looked at me and he kind of like a little pitiful little shake in his head. <laughs> He says, son, he says, why do I need a remote control when I have you? <laughs> and then he said, you, you want color? He says, you want color? He says, use your imagination. That way you can put any color you want. 
That's, uh, so you know, he had a practical answer for that. We kept our TV for the, uh, for the next few years until it finally went out. That's when we got a new one. But, uh, but I remember the images, the images that we saw on TV of the astronauts walking on the moon. I remember seeing them so vividly. You know, it's one-sixth the gravity. So when they were walking in their space, in their, in their lunar suits, you know, jumping and doing slow motion maneuvers, it's, it kind of like captivated me. I sat down in front and watched. Then I would go outside, and I would see the moon up there. And I would stare at it for a few minutes, come back, and watch, watch them again on TV. And then I would do that about four or five times. And that's when the, the actual... Uh, idea for me came to say, you know, that's what I want to be. I want to be an astronaut. You know, I'm sure every nine, ten year old kid at that age wanted to be an astronaut too. And that's the other thing I got to give credit for to my parents is I shared that dream with them. And instead of them saying, hey, you know, you're shooting too high, uh, maybe you ought to just think about finishing high school, going to college, they actually nurtured that dream. That's why I think they would have made good psychologists because they, they fed that dream, they nurtured it, and they said, you know, Anything's possible in this country, they said. Just get yourself a good education and work hard. You know, you put those two ingredients together, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, knowing, my, knowing how my dad is, you know, I'm sure what he was thinking behind, in the back of his head, he was probably saying, poor guy, doesn't stand a chance, but let's not burst his bubble, <laughs> you know. But, but no, but they actually, they actually did nurture, nurture that dream. And that's, that's when, uh, at the same time, my education started to gain traction. So the third part, the third event that sort of what I call sealed the deal for me to become an astronaut was when I was a senior in high school. And that was when I heard over the radio that some guy named Franklin Chang hyphen Diaz got selected as the first Hispanic astronaut. And I said, wow. I said, Chang, okay, I wasn't too crazy about the Chang part, but, <laughs> but the Diaz, I couldn't relate to the Diaz. <laughs> I mean, that's like Hernandez. And so I started reading about him. I started reading about him. And you know what I found out? I found out that there was many similarities between him and I. He came from a humble background from Costa Rica. You know, he had brown skin like me. He spoke English with an accent like me. Yet he was a US astronaut. And so I kind of got jealous, you know, jealous in a good way, because I said, you know, if he was able to do it, why can't I do it? And that sort of empowered me. And that goes back to what you guys are here. You guys are also role models in your community. That if folks go out there, young kids go out there and see you, and you see kids like you, you empower them to say, he looks just like me. He was able to do it. Why can't I do it? And I think that's what's important. And so that's when I made the personal promise to myself to, uh, to get selected and work as an astronaut. And so I went to college, Pacific. You guys heard my, my, my background in my work. I went to Pacific, went to graduate school at Santa Barbara, and then started working down the road here at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. I worked here 14 years at Lawrence Livermore Lab. And I started applying to NASA. And, uh, and Stephanie, I applied 12 times, 12 years in a row. Uh, so the, the, the other key is perseverance. It's perseverance. Because I applied the first six years, I would just get a thanks you know, postcard saying, we received your application. Don't call us. We'll call you kind of thing. You know? <laughs> and, 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 and so I just started building my career, my curriculum, and started getting work of becoming a pilot, a scuba diver, and doing work related to the space industry. And that's and six years into the process, I got my first call. And the selection process is, is actually pretty simple. Getting selected is a tough part, but the process is pretty simple. Uh, it, 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 it's, um, basically, there's uh, over 4,000 people that apply each year. And they don't select a class every year. They'll select it every two or four years. And what they do is they review those 4,000. And then after that, uh, they'll select about 300 where they'll take a closer look at your application. If you have technical publications, they'll ask for them so they can read them. They'll talk to your boss. After those 300 are reviewed, they'll down-select to 100, what I call the 100 lucky ones. Because these 100, uh, whenever there's a selection that year, get invited to spend a week at NASA, Johnson Space Center. And there, you spend one week where you go through a series of uh, psychological tests, 
uh, you know, and make sure that you're not crazy. And obviously, we need some improvement in that process. Uh, and 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 also, also they go very detailed medical exams. And I mean very detailed. And I'm not sure if any any there's any males over 40, but if you you are over 40, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And then, uh, and then, and then, and then it ends. It ends with a, uh, it ends with a uh, a series of uh, interviews with a panel of about 12 to 18 people. A lot of them uh, sitting astronauts. And then after that, everybody goes home. And then from there, about 20% get medically disqualified. Usually eyesight, something wrong with their ticker or hearing's not up to standards that they need. And so from those 80, they'll probably select about 40 to do a, a serious medical, I mean, a serious security background check. Make sure you're paying your taxes, you're a good citizen, all that. From those 40, then they'll select anywhere from 10 to 18 astronauts for that particular class. And that's how the process is. So year six was my first year that I got invited. I was made it to that 100, and to that 80, to that 40. And then guess what, I didn't get selected. So that was in 98, uh, right, 98. So um, I had to wait another two years. I kept applying, kept applying. And then uh, in 2000, again, I made it to the 100, 80, 40. This time, I didn't tell a lot of people because then I didn't have to explain a lot to, as to why I didn't get selected. And it was a good thing I didn't because I didn't get selected. <laughs> and, so, and so once again, you know, it, after eight years of applying, two interviews, I came out empty-handed. So I just kept applying. Uh, you know, four years later, uh, I was invited, before those four years, after the eighth year, I was invited to come and work at NASA as an engineer. I worked there, and then four years later, they did another selection round, and, uh, that, which is my 12th year in the whole process, and that's when I finally got selected. That was 2004. So, so what happens then is, uh, is your class shows up in, uh, from all over the country, they come from all walks of life. You know, they're researchers, they're engineers, they're doctors, geologists uh, from the military, and they show up as a class and they start training. So we train because obviously we're not we're not qualified to for space be assigned to a space mission. So we train for two years. Once you finish the training, uh, then you get a technical assignment, and then you get assigned to a mission. So that's what happened to me. I showed up at 2004, trained for two years, 2006, had a technical assignment, and in 2008, I got assigned to a mission. And then uh, last year was when the mission was fully realized. And so, uh, so, so the mission that we got selected, that I got selected for was STS-128. The uh, actual, it usually doesn't uh, match up that well, but in this particular case, it did match up very well. Uh, 128 stands for the 128th mission of the space shuttle fleet. And it was aboard uh, Discovery. I was the uh, flight engineer, uh, because, and I think it's the coolest uh, position because I sit right behind the, the commander and the pilot, kind of like in the middle, and I have the best seat of the house because it's uh, the panoramic view is what I call it as we take off into space. Uh, the mission specialist number one is to my right. And then, uh, so that's four of us on the flight deck. And then on the mid deck, you'll, uh, you'll see uh, we'll have three astronauts there. Those are usually our spacewalkers because they don't have any responsibilities during our ascent or descent of our mission. And so they're just uh, sitting there as passengers in the mid deck. And then uh, what you're going to see is you're going to see the, um, the, the actual launch sequence of our mission. We launched, uh, after several scrubs, we launched on August 28th, uh, about 11.30 at night. It was a night launch. And you're going to see how, how the launch goes, the sequence goes. You're going to see the three engines light up. Uh, inside, the way it feels is you, you hear the engines light up. You feel this gentle vibration as you're sitting there. Uh, you've been up there for about three hours, so you're ready to go. And, <laughs> and believe me, you know, you're up there for three hours, right? And one of the things I want to tell you is that you don't want to scrub because uh, if you launch, you know that in eight and a half minutes you're up in space and you can go to the restroom and activate the restroom and go to the restroom up there. Whereas if they scrub, you got to wait another hour and a half by f f before they finally extract you so you can go to the restroom. So, so you're always crossing your I hope we launch. I hope we launch. Uh, and, and, so, and so the way the launch sequence goes is, is, is they light up the three rocket, the three engines. You feel the vibration. 
And then about two seconds later, the two solid rocket boosters uh, light up. The, the uh, noise level goes up in order of magnitude. The vibration is more violent. Just when you think the whole thing is going to fall to one side and fall over, you feel a push in your back, and you're off to the races. You're up, you're up accelerating. Uh, and those two solid rocket boosters are only, they provide the thrust, the major thrust at the beginning. Uh, they're only lit up for two and a half minutes. In two and a half minutes, explosive boats separate them. Uh, parachutes come out on them, and they're recovered in the ocean by a boat that's waiting for them. The three engines are fed by this, the main tank, the central tank, that, the, the big tank. It's actually two little tanks uh, that, that, that has liquid uh, uh, oxygen and liquid hydrogen, and they're feeding the three engines. And they go on for another six minutes. And then, uh, and, and at that point, you're going 17,500 miles an hour. You're up about 280, 300 miles up above. And you're going around the world every 90 minutes. And so we were up there 14 days, uh, I, we went, which meant we went around the world in 217 times, about 5.7 million miles. I wish we had frequent flyers with <laughs> programs with the airlines. Because then, you know, it would be, I'd be sitting pretty. But, uh, but, but you'll see us, we rendezvoused with the International Space Station, physically uh, docked to them, uh, docked with them, and then uh, and did our work, and then undocked and came back home. And so if we start the video, you can see what... Um, the first thing you're going to see is you're going to see our mission patch. That's the first order of business of any new crew. You've got to have a patch, and you've got to design it. And, uh, of course, everybody's last name is on there, and there were seven of us. We had three main uh, objectives, and I'll explain them as we go along. But right now, the mission director is giving our commander the go-ahead to go and launch. If, if the volume can go up. This is the mid deck guys, the three of them. That's the three engines lighting up. And then solid rocket boosters. First four minutes, it's like an e-ticket ride in Disneyland. It's actually pretty, pretty neat. The second four and a half minutes, the uh, G-forces start building up, and it, and it feels, and it, and it feels like first you have a newborn baby on on your chest, then that baby grows to like a 600-pound gorilla, because you, you have trouble breathing. There you see the two uh, solid rocket motors uh, separating. The, the exhaust of the three uh, engines continuing on. It's, it's the exhaust. And right there you saw the explosive bolts for the separation. The next step you're going to see is the separation from the external tank. The external tank is not, is not uh, recoverable. It breaks up into pieces as it enters the atmosphere. And then in eight and a half minutes, we reach Miko, which is called main engine cutoff. And uh, there you can see, uh, that's me uh, that's waving there saying, hey, I, I can't believe we reached space here. And let me, you know, being the good engineer and scientist that I am, let me do a test here. And uh, the first thing I do is I throw something, say, does this thing float? <laughs> I said, I guess we are in space. <laughs> One of our object 
objectives uh, was to take one of our crewmates, Nicole Stott, uh, up to the International Space Station. We were going to leave her up there for uh, three months and bring back someone who had been up there for three months. Um, the, uh, once we get up there, one of the first things we do is we open up the payload bay doors. We do that because uh, the radiators are on the inside portion of the payload bay doors. They provide the cooling to our electronics equipment, so it's very important we do that first. And then uh, the f folks that were down in the mid-deck, three folks that were down in the mid-deck, start cleaning up the mid-deck. They remove and fold the chairs they were on uh, and start making room. There's Danny Olivas, so he's from El Paso. Uh, and they activate the galley and they activate the restroom, which you see right there. And, uh, and, and then uh, I, myself, uh, start putting together the portable onboard computers. Uh, and these are the ones that are going to help us during rendezvous with the International Space Station. Our commander, C.J. Sturkow, he's the last one to get out of his uh, pressure suit. Uh, while he does that, other folks, and I'm putting the computers together, other folks are putting other pieces of equipment together, including this psychoergometer. Remember that uh, there's zero G, you're in micro G environment, so we have to keep our legs, uh, muscles strong, so we exercise every day, there's a protocol. Every morning we do uh, the same thing we do at home with respect to hygiene, you know, we brush our teeth, we, uh, those of us that need it, we shave. And, uh, and then we look at what our day's assignment is for, for that day. Uh, one of the next day, we do it, what's called an orbital maneuver system burn, Ohm's burn, that bring us uh, closer to the International Space Station for our rendezvous. There you see Nicole Stahl with her binoculars looking at what's going to be her home for the next three months. That's about 20 miles away as she was looking at it. And of course, we get closer and closer. When we get about 600 feet, we do a maneuver, which is called a flip maneuver, where the station folks uh, are taking pictures of our underbelly. This is the perspective of the station uh, crew as they see us approaching the, uh, the International Space Station. We stop, we do the maneuver, they take high resolution pictures, and that's to make sure we didn't suffer any damage on our uh, thermal protection system, our belly, during ascent. Once we're cleared for that, uh, then they give us the go-ahead for prox ops, proximity operations, and this requires a, a lot of uh, high-level crew resource management as we get in closer and closer into the uh, onto the International Space Station, Rocky and uh, and basically uh, uh, dock physically dock Chief with them. Maybe about 0.06. Here comes a BM. I'm gonna do it. Okay. Should get it back in the yeah, middle. So that's we, okay. So we have yep. a good a firm idea of what yeah, it is. That's exactly. Text text warned us close. about that. Yeah. Okay, I think you got it up to about... During docking, our commander is the one that's in control. The pilot's giving him cues, uh, and I'm down at the computers uh, giving them the, uh, the rates, which is the, um, uh, which is the speed at which we're closing in, uh, the, uh, the distance, and trajectory. And you'll see when we finally bump into the uh, station, you'll see us bump right there. At this point, now we're waiting for the latches to latch on to the station. And then we're going to get some confirming cues, some lights that tell us that capture is confirmed. Okay, we're happy that we didn't bounce off of the station. Uh, this allows us to open our, our, our door that has access to the station. The station folks do the same thing at their end, and there's a little vestibule that basically uh, serves as the interface between us and the International Space Station. So, uh, so, so now, the uh, crew on the other side, Gennady Pedalka was the commander, Russian. He rings the, door, the, uh, the bell that basically uh, announces the arrival of a new crew. And so there's six of them there, and seven of us, so that's 13 astronauts at once uh, in space representing five countries. So truly an international affair there of, of us uh, working together. You see how happy they are of seeing us, and I can tell you that they're happy, not because we're such good buds, but these guys have been up there for about three or four months eating a bunch of dehydrated food, and they know we've got fresh vegetables and fruit. <laughs> so, so they're saying, oh yeah, what kind of food did you bring? One of the uh, second objectives, uh, the second objective of us was to take out the MPLM, Multipurpose Logistics Module, which is basically a small portable, libra uh, portable laboratory. It's more like a storage uh, thing than anything where we, we pick it up out of the payload bay door with the robotic arm 
and then we install it in one of the ports of the station. And you can see uh, Kevin Ford had the honors of doing that. I had the honors of deinstalling it and putting it back into the, onto the uh, shuttle. And once we do that, it allows the, our colleagues to actually open the door from the inside of this MPLM, and it gives us access to inside of it. You can see us wearing goggles and masks because for the first time, someone's going in there in a zero G environment. So there could be metal shavings, dust, particulates. And it's not until the filtering system catches all that, that we're allowed to go in there without any protection. Once we're allowed to go in there, we begin the sequence of, uh, of basically transferring over seven tons of material from that multi-purpose logistics module onto the International Space Station. And then we transfer about one ton of material back in, which includes trash and any equipment that they no longer need on the station. Nicole here, you can see her uh, take a, an experiment uh, that she started on the shuttle and transfers it to the station because it's her experiment and uh, she's gonna stay on station for the next three months. So all her experiments travel with her as well. And so here we are putting that together. Uh, here you see us having a meeting. Uh, really orientation is not an issue because uh, there is no right up or down. So we basically meet in any orientation. <laughs> And we're just discussing what we're going to be doing the next day. And of course, the next day is our first spacewalk. The first spacewalk was conducted by Danny Olivas and Nicole Stott. And, uh, and you see Tim Copra there. He's the one we traded for. He's the one that came home with us. But uh, he and I have the uh, dubious honor of uh, making sure that these guys uh, put on their spacesuits correctly. Because if you, if you, you see, if you realize uh, the spacesuit is the only thing that's going to be keeping them alive, that's their spaceship once they do their spacewalk. And we've got to make sure that the, uh, the helmets are well sealed, the gloves, the boots are well sealed, the life support system is working properly, the computers are working properly, communication is working properly, the uh, cameras, the lights, everything is working before we give them the go to go outside. And so we go through all those checks. It's about a three-hour process before they're even out the door. And, uh, and so uh, once we're convinced, we get out, they depressurize, it allows them to open up the outside door, and, uh, and out they go. You see the airlock thermal cover is open. You can egress the airlock. Remember to avoid that MMOD strike. Go into that. And we do have some cameras outside where, that we control, and uh, we see this through cameras. You can see Danny coming out. Uh, and initiating the spacewalk. They always go out in pairs of two. You can see those yellow handles. Those are the handles that astronauts translate in. And, uh, and they move uh, from, from, from module to module with those handles. Uh, one of the things that we do is since we don't have cameras everywhere, we do put cameras on their helmets, and that way we can see what they're doing uh, with respect to the work that they're doing. Uh, you can see here Danny is taking a picture of himself right now. Uh, and, and, uh, but but, but it's, it's actually a good way of us uh, keeping track of what work they're doing. Uh, and then when they have to move long distances or we have to take a lot of equipment with them, uh, what we do is we attach them to the end of the robotic arm. And Kevin Ford and I were the ones that were operating the arm while they were conducting their spacewalks. So we would move them from place to place. And uh, during that process, you would stop and you would see just amazing scenery. Uh, but of course, you gotta continue working uh, as, as we went. And I mentioned that you, you go around the world every 90 minutes. That means you have 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of nighttime. Uh, just because it becomes nighttime, we don't stop working. Uh, we just ask the astronauts to turn on their helmet lights. And as they turn on their helmet lights, they can continue working through the night. Uh, and, and, and then once daylight shows up again, then they can turn off their, uh, their helmet lights and they continue their work. But, uh, but it's certainly a, uh, a long process. It's about seven hours during a spacewalk. So these guys, uh, you know, after, the, after that's done, we let them back in. And, uh, and what we try to do is we try to extract them out of the spacesuits for as quickly as we can. You know, they've been in the spacesuit for three hours for prep and then seven hours out there, that's 10 hours. And they haven't eaten anything. They do have a camo bag of water that they drink. And I'm guessing if they did drink it, I'm guessing they got to go to the restroom. So we try to get them out of there as, uh, as quickly as we can. And then we uh, clean up the suits and uh, get them ready for the next spacewalk because they conducted a total of three, three spacewalks uh, between three of the astronauts, uh, Nicole, uh, Daniel Olivas, and uh, Christopher Fuglesan, who's a Swedish astronaut. 
uh, they did that. Now, while they're doing their spacewalks, other astronauts are doing other things throughout the uh, mission. And one of the things is we're transferring you know, that, those seven tons of material. Here, uh, here you see is a uh, treadmill. Remember how uh, Colbert won the naming rights of a module? <laughs> well, guess what? Uh, NASA wasn't about to give him a whole module, so we did the next best thing. We actually christened that the uh, Colbert treadmill, so, <laughs> so he got a treadmill named after him. And there's a little sticker there that actually has his picture on there. But, uh, but, 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 but yeah, we, uh, we did name it after him. We installed it and, uh, and, and uh, for the astronauts to have an additional piece of equipment to exercise. And then we moved in uh, uh, the, uh, the stuff that belonged to Tim Copra into the MPLM because um, he was gonna come home with us. Uh, and then after emptying the, uh, the front contents of the racks, we rotate the racks. And guess what? There's a whole bunch of other equipment on the backside that we have to uh, remove. And we have to put things in the right order. Uh, you know, there's a big effort in housekeeping on the International Space Station. In other words, whenever they say put this in this compartment, it's gotta be there because if you can't find it, it's like looking for a uh, needle in a haystack. And then uh, we use our feet as hands because uh, obviously we don't walk on, in space, so we sort of use it in novel ways to transport. Like right there, he's transporting food trays from the uh, MPLM to the International Space Station. And then once we make some room, we have some fun. You know, we, we wouldn't be space if you couldn't have fun. And uh, here, Nicole and I are just uh, enjoying the free space. Then I get this bright idea. I see these uh, bungee cords there, and I say, come here, Nicole. So, and then I push her, and I say, let me get this on film. <laughs> uh, Einstein was right. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. <laughs> and then uh, we're not supposed to play with, with food, but uh, we got an exception here so that we can uh, make our space eyeball. It's a lifesaver with water. And Nicole, I mean, and Tim Copra takes care of it. <laughs> Okay, no self-righteous Mexican would do this to a tortilla. Peanut butter on one side and jelly on the other. But, uh, <laughs> but it was Kevin Ford, our pilot, so we let, him, uh, we let him do it. But actually, it tasted pretty good. I tasted it. Our, our commander, Marine, gets a haircut every three days whether he needs it or not. And then uh, you wonder about hygiene. Uh, this is how we uh, take showers and stuff. Uh, shampoo our hair. We just put the shampoo on, on the hair. Uh, get a towel, rub it in, and dry it off, and we're good to go. When we take showers, we just wet the towel, and uh, we do what's called a cowboy shower. Just wet ourselves, and then there. You need a PhD to see why this thing rotates back and forth like that, but it's pretty interesting. Uh, Kevin Ford tried to explain to me. I couldn't get it. So I said, well, do it to me. See if that happens to me. But unfortunately, that didn't work out like that. <laughs> But it was fun, though. And nevertheless, it was fun rotating like that. I said, let me film it on camera just so you guys can appreciate that perspective. And if you uh, are wondering, yes, I did get dizzy. Uh, and then here, here I am at the uh, robotics workstation. Now I'm deinstalling the MPLM. And we're going to install it back into the payload bay. Uh, and, and, uh, and then uh, the very last night that all 13 of us are together, uh, we have dinner together for the very first time. Uh, we usually we had dinner at different times since we were so busy, and of course there's uh, it's international food. Uh, we had Mexican food, American, uh, Russian food, uh, French food, uh, and uh, it was just uh, a good feast that we had that day. And of course, uh, some people like to show off their food eating skills; other people shouldn't show it off. <laughs> the sad thing is he had been up there the longest. There you see us uh, toasting, drinking water, because it's from our uh, urine processing assembly system. So yes, we do drink our urine. And I promise it tastes just like water. <laughs> there you see Nicole Stoltz saying goodbye, because this is the, uh, this is the uh, last time we're going to see her. Uh, be, she stays on the station side. We stay on the, uh, on, on, on the uh, discovery side. And we close our doors, and this allows us to initiate the undocking sequence. And believe it or not, this uh, little button is the one that does it all. It initiates the sequence, and then it initiates a process that uh, is slow as molasses on a cold day, uh, where you then start separating yourself from the International Space Station. 
And actually, the springs on the docking mechanism, once you undo the hooks, provide the initial push for us to separate. Uh, we try not to fire the jets a lot. Since we're right next to the station, we don't want the plumes to contaminate our solar panels. And so, so we, we just try to uh, minimize, use the small jets and minimize our movement. And uh, like I said, it takes about an hour or so to, for us to fully uh, come out to a position where we can actually use the normal jets. And, uh, and during that time, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, staffing the computers that are giving us all the rendezvous information, rates, distances, and trajectory, and uh, feeding that information to our, our pilot, who is now at the controls of the shuttle, and, uh, and, and watching our separation. In about, about 20 minutes, you'll see us be about 20, 30 feet away, and, uh, which is about there. And in about 15, 20 more minutes, we get a couple hundred feet away, and we get a full view of the International Space Station. At that point, we begin our own circular maneuver around the International Space Station, because now it's our turn to take high-resolution pictures of the whole station. The engineers on the ground are gonna go ahead and, uh, and look at these pictures, make sure there's no micrometeorite, orbital debris hits on any part of the structure of the International Space Station. And that's the circular trajectory, the one that I'm feeding to uh, Kevin Ford, make sure that he uh, is indeed flying a uh, circular pattern around. At this point, he's, he's pretty much complete and he's uh, happy as a clam because that was a big maneuver for him. Uh, this then allows us to put on the, uh, the uh, pressure suits because uh, we're ready to come home now. And, and so we fire the jets, the atmosphere captures us, and all of a sudden you start feeling gravity. Uh, and let me tell you, after being 14 days in zero G, gravity does suck. <laughs> there you see the, uh, the, uh, the fact that we went 25 times the speed of, of uh, sound. We broke the uh, Mach 25 barrier as we come in. The flight director giving us last minute instructions. We were waved off of Kennedy Space Center for the second day in a row because of bad weather. So we ended up landing at Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, uh, Eric Bow, one of our fellow uh, astronauts is the Capcom. He's giving us all the winds, the weather, the data, the runway number for us to come in. There we are about 80, 90,000 feet. Pretty soon the uh, the shuttle starts behaving like an airplane. The aerodynamic surfaces start taking effect. Kevin Ford in control of the stick at this moment. And then for about a period of about 30 seconds, our, our pilot takes control. But the uh, main control is our commander. He's the one that actually lands it. pair of sonic booms. The late afternoon sunshine gleaming off its thermal protection heat shield. Three minutes until touchdown. Rick Sterko has taken back the stick from Kevin Ford. The vortices off the wings, very obvious. Discovery continuing its turn around the heading alignment circle, aligning with runway 22 at Edwards Air Force Base. This is the... Uh, this is the perspective of the, uh, of the pilots using the heads-up display, HUD display. That's what they're looking at right now. They're making the final turn onto final. And that green line you see there, that is the runway. It's highlighted right now. And it's steep. It looks like we're going straight into it. At this point, you're about 10,000 feet, 300 miles an hour is what it says right there. And you see the runway there. You're coming in at a pretty steep angle. You do what's called a flare maneuver. You see the speed, speed brakes are out. Very important not to forget the gear. <laughs> and you can see how CJ Stork, our commander, lands this. I mean, look at the back wheels. They just touch at the same time. So he's a, he's a good marine pilot. Look at that. He brings the nose down. Once we have a delayed chute deploy, once the nose gear comes down, they deploy the chute to uh, start slowing us down a bit more. This then allows uh, CJ to put the brake pedals 
and come to a full stop. When he announces full stop, that's when they stop the stopwatch and, uh, and the official end of the mission is recorded at that time. Houston Discovery, we'll stop. Copy, we'll stop. Welcome home, Discovery. Congratulations on an extremely successful mission, stepping up science to a new level on the International Space Station. And let me tell you, four hours later after that, we were in Boron at Domingo's. I, was, I had a beer in my hand and, <laughs> and eating carne asada, so it was pretty good. It was pretty cool. So, uh, so, so that's how, uh, you know, that's sort of like the summary of a typical mission to the International Space Station is. <laughs> and certainly, certainly, like I, I said, just to summarize what, what I've talked about is the fact that, you know, it, it was nice to be able to realize the dream, but it certainly wasn't something that where I'd say, hey, I did this myself. I had a lot of help, as you can saw from my, uh, the way I spoke about how I became an astronaut. Anecdotally, uh, you know, I had help from my parents, my teachers, friends, uh, colleagues, and, uh, and a little bit of per perseverance. So, you know, 12 times is a lot of times to apply and to want it, but figure if you want it bad enough, you keep doing it. And, uh, and it certainly did, wasn't hurting my career, so it wasn't like I th thought I was wasting my time during the application process. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much to Jose for being here today. So we do have a lot of questions from Dory, and I'm sure you have questions. Uh, to be honest, he literally has to fly fairly soon. So we'll try to keep it short, maybe ask one or two questions from Dory, and maybe one or at most two lives if you want to line up and, and keep it short. So the first question uh, uh, from someone in Mountain View uh, called John R. He says, how do you feel about the fact that since the Apollo program ended, We've never gone beyond low, low air or orbit. Do you think that's sufficient for a national space program, or should we press for more manned space exploration, return to more Mars, perhaps? Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think uh, he's right in a sense that um, that we've only got three missions left for the space shuttle fleet, and then they're going to get retired. Uh, what that does is that frees up resources for us to invest in uh, in in technology that's going to allow us to go beyond low Earth orbit. It does us uh, no good to just go to the moon and cool our heels there. We want to be able to make sure we can also go all the way to Mars. For that, we need advanced propulsion systems. We need radiation protection. Uh, and, and we also need to, uh, to learn how to uh, live long duration in a zero G environment away from the protection of the Earth's magnetic fields with respect to radiation. So, uh, so, so yeah, I think we're heading in that direction. So Stacy from Mountain View, she says, I'm a daughter of a proud Kennedy Space Center employee and have seen many shuttle launches in my lifetime. I'm saddened by the decision to end the shuttle program. What are your thoughts on the decision and its, in, and its impact on Florida's space coast? Yeah, I mean, it, it's the equivalent when we, um, you know, the, 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 uh, there's no denial that in ending the space program, the shuttle space program, there's going to be a shift of talent that's needed within NASA. In other words, the operation side of maintaining the shuttle, prepping it for a launch, and uh, refurbishing the shuttle, those tasks aren't going to be needed. So there is going to be uh, some, some type of human resources let go with respect to the fact that that's what's not needed now. But at the same time, the budget of NASA is actually going up. So the workforce is not really going to go down. It's just going to be a shift of a different type of workforce. And, uh, and, and you know, it's basically the same thing that happened between the, uh, the era of the Apollo and the space shuttle mission. If you see the history during Apollo, when we canceled Apollo, there was a big drop in the number of folks needed on the operation side. And then when the uh, shuttle came back, uh, when we brought the shuttle to life, uh, those people were picked up and, and then you had a real vibrant workforce. I mean, the same thing is going to happen with uh, retiring the shuttle. You know, there's going to be a dip at Kennedy Space Center because they're more primary operations oriented. But when we get the architecture defined and built, then uh, the workforce is going to steadily go back up. Yeah, Jose, well, thank you very much for, you know, share all this with us. We are really uh, happy and, you know, it was great, seriously. We want to give you this uh, oh, thank little you very much. gift, uh, token of appreciation. Uh, thank great. you very much for being here with thank Google. You. I think these guys uh, are very happy with your uh, messages. And uh, just want to let you know that uh, we got some T-shirts uh, that uh, it's a raffle, right? Yeah, so we yeah. got an email. Uh,
with the winners. Some random algorithm, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And just so, just so he makes sure he gives out the right amount, I think I signed six of them, all right? So <laughs> make sure he gives away six. Yeah, yeah. We're going to sell one on eBay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you very much, sir. Well, Appreciate thank you. it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Hey, thanks, Mario. Gracias. Gracias. Thanks.